last hundred years have seen war waged on a greater scale than at any other time in human history. In this new series, my son Dan and I will be examining some of the greatest battles of the 20th century. Battles that have shaped the world we live in today. We'll fly to the Pacific to find out how America turned the tide against Japan. We'll see what remains of the ravaged city of Stalingrad. We'll go to the Far East to visit the battlefields of Vietnam and the front line of the ongoing conflict in Korea, still unresolved to this day. We'll travel to the Falkland Islands, scene of the last war on British territory, and journey to the Middle East to describe battles at the heart of the mighty relationship between Arabs, Israelis, and the Western world. The 20th century saw the most radical transformation ever in how battles were fought. It witnessed the last cavalry charge and the first nuclear bomb. More people, both military and civilian, were killed in the conflicts of the 20th century than in any other. Throughout this series, I'll be finding out what it was like for the soldiers, sailors and airmen who found themselves fighting often thousands of miles away from home. The enemy is not the only challenge in this dog. A difficult terrain. And I'll be analyzing how the commanders devise new strategies to exploit revolutionary advances in technology. Our series begins here in northern France, at the start of the 20th century, with the most destructive war the world had yet seen. The fighting involved tens of millions of troops from all around the world and led to a greater death toll than any previous war in history. The First World War, the Great War, established the way that battles are fought to this very day. New weapons like tanks and aircraft were used for the first time with devastating effect. There was one battle more than any other that harnessed the power of these new weapons to turn the tide of the war. It was fought here in northeast France on the Western Front in 1918. It was the Battle of Amiens. By the beginning of 1918, Europe's superpowers had fought each other to a standstill on the killing grounds of northern France and Belgium. A war that had been supposed to last six months had dragged on the three and a half blood-soaked years. When the First World War began, nobody had expected the conflict would turn out the way it did. Germany and her coalition partners, Austro-Hungary, Bulgaria and Turkey, were fighting to secure dominance in Europe and the Middle East. In the East, they had driven deep into Russia and captured huge swathes of land. And in the West, they'd invaded first Belgium and then France, expecting a quick victory. The British Army, including men from Australia, Canada and other countries of the Empire, had helped the French secure the rest of France, but they had failed to push the Germans out. By 1918, the Allies were still where they had been three years earlier, with the British holding the line closest to the Channel ports. The Great War had turned into a deadly stalemate. Battles like Passchendaele, Ypres, the Somme and Verdun, further down the Western Front, had resulted in a catastrophic loss of life on both sides, but the front line had hardly moved. To break this deadlock, 
there would have to be a startling change of strategy. Without it, it seemed the war would never end. The soldiers have been dug in here on the Western Front for the best part of three years, and they've been slogging it out in a chain of murderous offensives that seemed to them to be pretty futile. Life in these trenches alternated between long periods of mind-numbing boredom and short moments of extreme danger. There was nothing to be seen, only a line of earth and sandbags with occasional pieces of timber lying about. When you get tired of sitting, you can get up and have a peek between the sandbags. But a man can be in the trenches for a year and never have fired a shot. The daily routine in the trenches was made infinitely worse by the fact that months of shelling had destroyed the landscape. What had been a countryside of rolling farmland was now one of utter devastation. For the men living and fighting in these dreadful conditions, it must have often seemed like the war was going to go on forever. But thousands of miles away from these trenches, events were now taking place that would bring these men hope that the end of the war was finally in sight. Throughout the war, there had been a vicious fight for control of the Atlantic shipping lanes. At first, German U-boats only aimed to sink British vessels. By 1917, they made the mistake of targeting supply ships belonging to the United States of America. For America's President Woodrow Wilson, this was an outrage too far, forcing him to declare war on Germany. After three years of watching and waiting, America was now firmly in the fight. Hundreds of thousands of strong, fresh American troops would soon be arriving in northern France. It was exactly what the exhausted Allied soldiers on the Western Front had been waiting for. With this huge infusion of Americans, the balance of power should shift irreversibly away from the Germans into the Allies' favor. As we marched through the town, the sidewalks were full of people. We felt so proud and important that such a fuss was being made over us. The French girls would jump in the ranks and throw flowers at us. Of course, we were looking forward to the great adventure ahead of us. We were looking forward to the fight. From June 1917, the trickle of Americans arriving in France became a flood. But there was a problem with these American troops, nicknamed Doughboys. They were raw, inexperienced recruits. Once they arrived in France, they'd need months of training to get them ready for battle. The fact was, the Allies would have to hold the line against the Germans by themselves for a while longer. And if that was bad news, there was worse to come from the war in the East. Since the beginning of the war, Germany had been locked in battle with Russia on the Eastern Front. But by the beginning of 1918, this had changed dramatically. After seizing power in the Russian Revolution, communists made peace with Germany. With the war in the East at an end, in early 1918, hundreds of thousands of crack German troops could be freed up to fight on the Western Front. For the time being, the balance of power had swung in favor of the Germans. But if the Germans were to win this war, they had to make their move 
before the Americans became fully operational. After three and a half long years, the war had suddenly become a race against time. By spring 1918, it looked as if Germany would win that race. Germany was counting on one man to deliver victory, their chief strategist, Erich Ludendorff. Ludendorff had presided over Germany's victory in the east. Now he planned to finish off the Allies in the west. Ludendorff knew this could be Germany's last chance to win the war. Even with freed up German troops flooding in from the east, Ludendorff still didn't have the manpower to launch a general offensive all along the Western Front. So he decided to focus on one part of the line. If he could push the British back into the sea, the French would be on their own and the war would be as good as won. He came up with a plan called Kaiserschlacht, the Emperor's Battle. His troops would concentrate their attacks in a series of powerful punches. The first punch was aimed to drive a wedge here between the British and the French, where the two armies met, just east of the city of Amiens. Amiens was the most important city on the Western Front, but it lay only 39 miles behind a part of the front that was poorly defended. It was a key transport hub, vital for getting supplies and reinforcements up to the Allied trenches. If Ludendorff could capture this city of Amiens, then he would divide the British from the French and cut their supply line. He chose March the 21st to launch his offensive and named it after Germany's patron saint, Michael. A massive force of unprecedented strength and quality began to be put together for the offensives. The German army was scoured for the toughest, fittest and most experienced soldiers. The weak and the old were transferred to the rear. Only the very best of all would be trained up as stormtroopers, specialist units of shock troops that would punch through the Allied lines. The men of the Storm Battalions were treated like football stars. They lived in comfortable quarters, they did their jobs and disappeared again, and left it to the poor foot sloggers to dig in. It wasn't just fresh troops Ludendorff was counting on. He intended to throw away the old rule book on how to fight a battle. The front lines ran through these fields just here. This is where I'm standing, 40 miles east of Amiens. The German infantry were here in a series of trenches skirting round the town of St. Quentin. Just a few hundred metres away across no man's land were the British infantry in their trenches. Their heavy guns further back, here and here. Usually an infantry attack was preceded by a long indiscriminate bombardment, lasting days if not weeks to clear a path through enemy defences. The problem was that these long bombardments gave the enemy plenty of warning that an infantry attack was imminent. This time, Ludendorff planned a barrage of just five hours, but with more artillery guns than ever before. For the first two hours, a mixture of gas and high explosive shells would target the British artillery positions back here. Then they would fire on the British infantry positions further forward. The bombardment would keep the British hunkered down in their trenches. Exactly five hours after the bombardment started, the elite force of German stormtroopers would begin their advance. Ludendorff hoped that this artillery fire plan, coupled with the stormtroopers, would cause such mass confusion that the entire British front line would fall apart in just one day. In Ludendorff, the Germans had a strong commander with a clear battle plan. 
On the Allied side, there was no man in overall charge. The British were led by Field Marshal Douglas Haig. He rarely saw eye to eye with the French Chief of Staff, General Ferdinand Foch. And now there was also the American commander, General John Pershing. There was little sign of coordinated leadership between the Allied commanders, and March 1918 would present them with their greatest challenge so far. Across no man's land, the British Army were woefully unprepared to deal with any kind of offensive. The ground had frozen hard during the winter, so they didn't even have a proper network of trenches. On top of this, they'd had to take over an extra 42 miles of the front line to ease up pressure on the French. Worst of all, though, was the fact that the British government had been so horrified with the losses of 1917, they hadn't sent enough men to the front in 1918. The British Army were sitting ducks. We cannot tell what even the next moment has in store for us. But what will this same spot be when the Germans attack? Bloody inferno. It may happen at any moment. A sudden jump from stillness into hell. On the stroke of 4.40 a.m. on March the 21st, the eerie calm in the Allied trenches was broken by the heaviest bombardment of the entire First World War. Six and a half thousand guns and three and a half thousand trench mortars fired virtually simultaneously along a 46 mile front in the greatest concentration of modern firepower to date. Into this brew of high explosive and razor sharp shrapnel was mixed a concoction of lethal gases which hung in the air for hours, burning the eyes of soldiers and horses. Built British trenches, the German artillery bombardment was obliterating whole regiments at a time. Entire units were literally being wiped off the face of the earth. The British were being slaughtered. Such hell makes weaklings of the strongest, and no human's nerves or body were ever built to stand such torture, noise, horror, and mental pain. At 9.40 a.m., the first wave of German troops scrambled forward in their gas masks through the fog. They were so well prepared that they had maps showing British gun emplacements sewn into their sleeves. They were Ludendorff's elite, the stormtroopers. the stormtroopers forced their way through gaps in the Allied lines, which were already weakened by the artillery barrage. Armed with light machine guns, hand grenades and flamethrowers, they swarmed forward. Whenever they came up against particularly stubborn resistance, they'd skirt around it, looking for weak points elsewhere and seeking out the more exposed artillery positions in the rear. The stormtroopers left the job of mopping up any remaining strongpoints to the main infantry force moving up behind. 
maps appearing all along the front line. Tens of thousands of Ludendorff's regular German infantry now advanced and were surprised at how quickly they broke through. The British had lost control of the situation. We crossed a better tangle of wire without difficulty and at a jump were over the front line. The English jumped out of their trenches and fled by battalions across the open. They stumbled over each other as they fled and in a few seconds the ground was strewn with dead. Only a few got away. Thousands of British troops were cut off and surrounded and forced to surrender at this remorseless attack. Thousands more, suffering from the effects of gassing, coughed and staggered their way to the rear where they hoped to find some shelter. By midday, the British troops facing the attack had lost a third of their number. A full-scale British retreat had begun. For days, the German advances continued. Then, on April the 5th, the Allies finally managed to stand firm, just 11 miles from Amiens. Ludendorff's first offensive had won a remarkable series of territorial gains for the Germans. That village is the furthest they got. Here it is, Vie Bretonne. They'd advanced 28 miles and made a massive dent in the British front line. But the British line had not broken. Over the next eight weeks, Ludendorff launched four more offensives. Here, 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 and here. The last advance took them to within 37 miles of Paris. Each time, the offensives fell short of that crucial breakthrough. Despite everything Ludendorff threw at them, the Allies were holding on. The outcome of the First World War now hung in the balance. The Germans had extended their front line so much, they were now stretched very thinly along the length of the Western Front. And the Allies were finally starting to regroup. It was a critical point in the race against time. That wood marked the tip of the German advance towards Paris. Control of it gave the Germans a key strategic foothold on the road to the French capital. If the Allies were to prevent Ludendorff from strutting down the Champs-Élysées, the German stronghold in Bellow Wood would have to be cleared. In the blazing heat of June the 6th, Allied troops prepared to start their advance on this wood. But these men weren't British or French. Instead, the task of clearing Bellow Wood had been given to the United States Marine Corps. For the first time in World War I, the Americans were going on the offensive. Even though it had been 14 months since the United States had declared war on Germany, this had not been long enough to master modern tactics. Now the US Marines prepared to retake Bellow Wood in the old-fashioned way advancing line abreast. Over their heads, American guns laid a barrage of shells to soften up the German defenses. But the advancing Marines were in for a nasty shock. Hidden amongst the tightly packed trees, there were units of dogged German soldiers, veterans of the Russian front. They had the perfect cover for their machine gun nests and interlocking fields of fire. When the Marines got close enough, the Germans let rip. We hadn't gone 50 yards when they cut loose at us from the woods ahead. And more machine guns than I had ever heard before. I have a vague recollection of urging the whole line on faster, 
We came to an open wheat field full of red poppies, and here we caught hell. Some of the Marines fought their way through the machine gun fire and managed to establish a small foothold in this forest, but it cost them terrible casualties. Elsewhere on the battlefield, one young American officer was told to retreat by some French troops that were pulling back. He famously said, retreat, hell, we just got here. The difficulty with Bellow Wood was that you never knew where the front was. While you were fighting in one direction, all of a sudden, without warning, you would find there's some Germans to the rear that needed to be mopped up. That was Bella Wood. Five times the Marines made headway, five times they were beaten back. But on the sixth attempt, the Marines finally prized Bella Wood away from the German grip. It had been a terrible cost. In their first encounter with the Germans, the US Marine Corps suffered 10,000 casualties. With the Allied victory at Bellow Wood, Ludendorff's path to Paris had been blocked. The Marines hadn't won the war, but they had helped save the Allies from defeat. More importantly, the Germans had come face to face with the Americans for the first time, and the Doughboys had delivered a massive psychological blow to German morale. No one could now doubt that the Americans were in the war for real. If those in front of us are fair specimens of the average American troops, and if they are as many as they say they are, then goodbye for us. Throughout the spring offensives, Ludendorff had committed everything he had, and he now came face to face with the plain truth, that his army was exhausted and overextended and he had lost more men than he could ever replace. And for all that, he'd still failed to break the Allied line. Now the Allies had the opportunity, and they seized it. They would now take the fight to the Germans. The Allied attempt to break through on the Western Front would be led by a British general, Sir Henry Rawlinson. Rawlinson had been the commander at the Battle of the Somme back in 1916, where 58,000 British soldiers had been lost in one day. This would be his chance to prove he'd learnt the lessons of past battles. The Allies now came up with a plan for a counter-offensive that was one of the most significant initiatives of the war. It was to be a milestone in military history. The idea came in July 1918 at a conference of Allied generals, which offered him a chance to redeem his reputation. His men controlled the ground east of Amiens, where Ludendorff had now thinned out his troops, presenting Rawlinson with a perfect spot for a breakthrough. What Rawlinson came up with was an imaginative and radical new strategy. He would concentrate a force of around 350,000 troops along a 17-mile front. This force would massively outnumber the Germans facing them. North of the River Somme, in this hilly country, was the British Three Corps. Below them, the Australians. On the other side of this railway line, the Canadians. And next to them, the French. What attracted Rawlins into this terrain was that apart from the rugged and more difficult ground to the north, it was dry and open, ideal territory for the Allies' newest weapon, tanks. 
Today, tanks and armoured vehicles are one of the most important weapon systems in a modern army. Back in 1918, troops regarded them with quite a lot of suspicion. They were prone to mechanical failure and they were slow. Their top speed was about four miles per hour and this made them vulnerable to enemy artillery fire. Tanks could be very claustrophobic and disorientating, but perhaps worst of all was the fact there was no separation between where the engine was and the area for the crews, which meant that after half an hour, temperatures could reach about 100 degrees Fahrenheit. Not only did the men frequently suffer from burns, but more crewmen died from carbon monoxide poisoning than were killed by enemy action. Usually, after just one day of battle, tank crews had to be sent to recover in a field hospital from the experience. But despite this, they did have their advantages. They were invulnerable to machine gun fire and they could crush barbed wire. Lastly, they put the fear of God into the Germans. The Germans had virtually no tanks, but now they were about to face the greatest concentration of tanks ever assembled on a battlefield. The tanks were only part of Rawlinson's grand design. The Battle of Amiens would use all the resources he had, working closely together, just as they do today. We've come to Salisbury Plain, to watch a combined arms exercise, the modern day equivalent of what Rawlinson had in mind for the Battle of Amiens. One of the main roles of the tank, and I, and I don't think it's really changed, is actually to help uh, protect the infantry and deliver them onto the enemy position in good order. Uh, and that's something the tank does very well indeed. Both tanks and infantry are supported by the big guns of the artillery. Gunners back in 1918 didn't have computers or satellites to help them find the right range. Normally before a battle, they would fire off test shots, but before the Battle of Amiens, they were ordered to use only maps and mathematics so as not to alert the Germans. Four, five, seven mil. A battery can, can drop something like four and a half tonnes of explosives on an area in a very short period of time. Um, so, you know, they, they're the people that give us a great shock effect on the enemy. Unlike 1918, today's infantry are carried into battle by armoured personnel carriers. But the carriers can only take them so far. In the final stage of an assault, there's no alternative but to get out and go in on foot. Air power is the final component of the all-arms attack. It's crucial that, uh, that all the, the different elements work together. Tanks on their own are very, very vulnerable. Uh, likewise, the, the infantry and everything else. So it's crucial that the tanks, the engineers, the artillery uh, and the air support all work together to, to, to destroy the enemy positions. So as Rawlinson approached the Battle of Amiens, he had a, a quite new system of weapon systems, tactics and everything. It's all arms cooperation. That's right, and although the, uh, the, the weapons and the vehicles have, have become much more technologically advanced over the years, the basic tactics that they used back in 1918 haven't really changed a great deal. 
Isn't it amazing how everyone we've talked to today has kept saying what we're seeing today is, is it began back in 1918. It's extraordinary. All their tactics are really date back from then. And you consider that two years before 1918, it was still just a bunch of riflemen lining up in a line and walking towards the enemy trenches. It's amazing exactly. how much change happened in those two years. And what's so impressive, we've seen all arms working together, aircraft, tanks, infantry, combining to overwhelm the enemy. August 1918 would be the first time in history that all available weapons were coordinated on such a scale. To a meticulous timetable, the guns would create a curtain of fire that would move forward 100 metres every three minutes, wiping out many German defensive positions. Protected by the cover of fire, the Allied infantry would advance, and the closer they followed the barrage, the more likely they were to overcome their enemy. When infantry found themselves up against stiff opposition, they would call in the tanks to overrun German positions. They had lighter tanks too, called whippets. They were twice as fast as the heavy tanks and could look for gaps in the enemy lines through which they could drive and cause havoc. They'd be the cavalry of the future, but in 1918, they could still only do eight miles an hour. Horses were still faster, and Rawlinson had thousands of them waiting to gallop into battle. Rawlinson set his men three objectives. First, he drew a green line on the map, two miles behind the first enemy line. He gave them two hours to reach it. There, they'd consolidate and new forces would pass through them and fight their way through to the red line, which he marked three miles further on. And if by the end of the day they could then reach his blue line, they would have achieved an eight mile advance altogether. It would be the biggest advance in one day's fighting of any allied force on the Western Front since the war began. In early August, Amiens was a ghost town. The population had been evacuated during the Ludendorff offensives. Now, the city was only 11 miles behind the front line and no civilians had been allowed to return. The only people here were military and there were more of them on their way. The troop buildup was hidden by a shroud of secrecy. The element of surprise was essential if the British plan was to succeed. Sand was even laid down on some of the deserted roads to deaden the sound of the troops and artillery massing in and around the city. And hundreds of tanks were hidden on the banks of the tree-lined canals. To make sure each soldier knew just how important it was to maintain secrecy, a small note was pasted into their pay books. It told them that if they were captured by the Germans, they were allowed to say their name, their serial number, and their rank, and nothing else. It ended with the words, keep your mouths shut. A few days before the battle began, reports reached German commanders that unusual noise had been heard outside Amiens, perhaps signifying an Allied build-up. But Ludendorff discounted these reports. There is nothing, he said, to justify this apprehension, as long as our troops are vigilant and do their duty. Rawlinson's obsessive secrecy was paying off. The early hours of August the 8th provided the perfect conditions for the launch of Rawlinson's elaborate plan. It was a moonless night, and from the river valleys, a ground mist provided valuable cover for the tanks rumbling into position. This countryside was an anthill of activity as tens of thousands of Allied troops moved towards the front line. 
The men were under strict instructions. There was to be no shouting, no flashlights and no cigarettes. No unnecessary noise. The silence played on our nerves a bit. As we got our guns into position, you could hear drivers whispering to their horses and men muttering curses under their breath. And still the silence persisted. Zero hour was set at 4.20 a.m., the hour before dawn. As it approached, all was silent. The moment British guns had opened fire on German positions, the British infantry had started their attack. The creeping barrage which the advancing foot soldiers now hugged as closely as possible was delivered by 700 heavy guns. At the same time, hundreds more guns concentrated on German strong points and artillery positions further back. 17 miles along the front, flares lit up the countryside as a mass of troops and tanks moved forward under the barrage. Canadian and Australian infantry advanced. The early morning fog was so thick they could only see about 10 yards in front of them. It was made even murkier by the smoke from the exploding artillery shells. traveling fast. The sweat was rolling down my face. The shells were bursting everywhere, some of them very low. Machine gun bullets also whistled over us from the left flank, where the advance had been held up for a while. Precisely as planned, the creeping barrage and the almost simultaneous infantry assault took the Germans totally by surprise. Some lead Allied units stormed into enemy trenches and bunkers and captured or killed the German defenders before they had any chance to organize a counterattack. At 6.30 a.m., this village of Marcel Cave became the target of the Canadian infantry, but they could make little headway against well-dug-in German machine guns. Then help appeared in the form of a lumbering Mark V British tank. Its commander, a lawyer from Somerset, sized up the situation and advanced into the village. German positions were blasted away by the tank's six-pound guns. The rest were crushed under its tracks. It was all over in about half an hour, and the tank commander handed the village over to the Allied infantry, but not until, in a typical lawyer-like fashion, he'd received a receipt. The village of Marcel Cave 
was now officially in Allied hands. The taking of this village of Marcel Cave put the Canadians across Wallinson's first objective, his Green Line. British soldiers operating north of the River Somme had been given less distance to cover because they were fighting on rougher terrain. But about three hours into the battle, most of Rawlinson's units had reached their objectives. Now they could rest while new troops were pushed through to continue the attack. By around 9 a.m., the fog was beginning to lift right the way across the wide battlefield. And Rawlinson was now able to employ his final weapon in his armory, aircraft. The Royal Air Force, barely a few months old, sent in 600 fighters and bombers to provide close air support to the Allied infantry. Phosphorus bombs were dropped ahead of the advancing tanks, and the planes strafed German ground targets like machine gun emplacements, which were much easier to spot from the air. Low-flying planes ate away at German morale. For any experienced British airman, it was a bewildering experience. We were over the target and dropping bombs before I realized we'd crossed the lines. I leaned over the side to watch them fall. We gave a look down from a high building and felt as though you must throw yourself down. I had to turn away. Gaps were now appearing in the German line which the Canadian and Australian troops tried to exploit as quickly as possible. This led to one of the more bizarre sights of the day. A group of Canadian cyclists pedalled off down the road, their rifles slung across their shoulders. They were escorting a group of armour-plated cars carrying machine guns. The Allies were willing to try anything to increase their speed and mobility. The cyclists sped off down the road looking for German positions. This mobility paid off when they came across the enemy-held village of Mezières. The cyclists rode through the back streets and overwhelmed a German machine gun post from behind. But in this area, north of the River Somme, the British ran into the most stubborn resistance of all. They were heading across here towards that high ground over there called Chipilly Ridge, when they ran into concentrated fire that stopped them in their tracks. British troops didn't have that many tanks supporting them because the terrain on this side of the Somme was unsuitable. To make matters worse, these men had borne the brunt of months of heavy fighting and they were weakened and exhausted. They did manage to get to the edge of this open field just opposite Chapilly Ridge over there. But as soon as they got here, they were driven back into these woods by devastating German machine gun fire. The British north of the Somme were pinned down in front of Chapilly Ridge. But to the south of the river, Rawlins's plan was ahead of schedule. By late morning, most of his men had reached the second objective, the Red Line. They'd moved a remarkable five miles in half a day. Already, some of the light whippet tanks had pressed on at a heady eight miles an hour causing havoc behind enemy lines. The exploits of one of these tanks, nicknamed Musical Box, would pass into legend. For nine hours, it ran wild, attacking German artillery from the rear, surprising resting German troops, and even ramming a truck into a stream. The Germans peppered the tank with bullets. They perforated fuel tanks stored on the roof and soon petrol was flooding down inside the tank. The crew were forced to don gas masks as they pushed on, now ankle deep in petrol. 
Soon, a German shell hit the tank and it burst into flames. The three crewmen scrambled to escape, and as they did so, one of them was shot dead and the other two captured by the Germans. The British tank drivers weren't the only ones to feel the heat of the German guns that afternoon. On the southern banks of the River Somme, Australian troops were taking a beating from German artillery firing at them from across the river, from positions high up on Chipilly Ridge, which the British were still struggling to capture. Hours after the British were supposed to have captured this vital sector of the north bank of the Somme, the area was still in German hands. Every time British troops tried to leave the shelter of this wood, they were cut down by German machine gun and artillery fire. The prospects for advancing any further looked grim, and it wasn't until the next day that Allied troops finally managed to secure the north bank of the Somme. But on this first day of battle, August the 8th, Rawlinson's units south of the River Somme were pushing deeper and faster into German-held territory than ever before. To keep up the pace of his advance, Rawlinson ordered his horsemen to go into the front line. Two entire cavalry divisions, over 20,000 horsemen, now moved up to the front through the infantry to begin the attack on the final objective, the Blue Line. The cavalry surged forward, easily outstripping the lumbering tanks that were supposed to provide them with supporting fire. But once the horsemen left the tanks behind, they found themselves at the mercy of German machine guns. One group of horsemen left this village of Bokor and ran into lethal fire from that wood over there. Men and horses crashed to the ground. The surviving horses stampeded. Even with this bloodshed, August the 8th would still be the British cavalry's most successful day of fighting on the Western Front during the entire war. The German line had been shattered, and for the first time in years, the cavalry could charge through the gaps. They galloped east, sowing chaos behind enemy lines and taking thousands of prisoners. By noon, it was clear that enemy resistance was confined to a few small pockets. Everywhere else, their positions were collapsing. Allied soldiers found that the German troops were all too willing to surrender to them. In fact, one lone Australian was nearly overwhelmed when a hundred Germans tried to give themselves up. The once mighty German army was showing signs of falling apart. The Germans were surrendering everywhere. You could feel the hair pricking up on your spine with excitement because we knew it was going to be the end of the war. Ludendorff lost more ground to the Allies on the first day of the Battle of Amiens than on almost any other day in the war on the Western Front. But what he found even harder to accept was that entire German units had surrendered wholesale. And the skill with which the British had coordinated tanks Aircraft and artillery was beyond anything the Germans were now capable of. The morale and discipline of the German fighting machine had cracked. Ludendorff later called August the 8th the blackest day for the German army in this war. <laughs> 
he had a nervous breakdown and told the Kaiser the war must be brought to an end. Rawlinson's attack went on for three more days, then finally lost momentum. The Battle of Amiens was over. But it earned Rawlinson a place in military history as the man who used new technology and tactics to liberate warfare from the tyranny of the trenches. Those few days in August 1918 turned the tide of the First World War. After the Battle of Amiens, the British and French, refreshed by American troops, fought on for another three months, liberating more and more German-held territory. At the start of October 1918, the Germans finally asked America's president, Woodrow Wilson, for an armistice. Early in the morning of November the 7th, the Supreme Allied Commander, Marshal Foch, arrived here by train in the forest of Compiègne, outside Paris. Just after 5 a.m. on the 11th of November, the leader of the German delegation signed the armistice document. It would take effect at 11 that morning. After more than four years of fighting and 15 million dead, the guns were now silent. A new world order emerged from the First World War, a world without Kaisers in Germany or Tsars in Russia, a world with new systems of government like communism and new countries like Yugoslavia and Iraq. And with it, this new order brought new tensions and rivalries that would plague the world for the rest of the 20th century. But the darkest legacy of the First World War began in a military hospital where a corporal in the German army was recovering from the effects of being gassed by the British. He was seething with resentment at what he perceived as Germany's national humiliation. That resentment would simmer away until 20 years later, it ignited a second great global conflict. That corporal's name was Adolf Hitler, and he would never forget the experience of 1918. Next time, in 1942, these Pacific Islands were at the heart of a battle between America and Japan. I'll be looking at how a new form of warfare at sea demanded split-second decisions from the commanders. And I'll be revealing the risks taken by servicemen and learning the skills they needed to survive. This titanic struggle took place over just one day. It was the battle of Midway.